So we're going to talk about healing hindrances, and this will be part two. And we're trying to kill every doubt that there can be about healing. And we know that there are many Bible passages that trip people up. They may believe that Jesus took stripes on his back, but then they run into passages. But what about this? And what about that? And so these things kind of war against them and their ability to believe. And so we're going to keep going through this, and it might be for a few more weeks. So today, let's go ahead. Um, so last time we talked about um, in God's time you'll be healed, where people think that God has a special time for you to be healed, and it's not going to happen any sooner than that. And we saw that the reality is, from God's perspective, healing, it's, it's finished like 2,000 years ago. He already said, yes, be healed, and Jesus already paid for it. He already provided it. So it's a done deal from God's perspective. So God's time is be healed and, in fact, just walk in health. That's his will. Okay, so any hindrance time-wise to being healed, it's, it's on us as far as, you know, not believing, or it could be the devil is resisting us extraordinarily and we have to continue to fight against him so perseverance would be necessary okay then we saw that believe it or not in some church circles they teach that you're glorifying god uh, in your sickness by being sick because in their wrong doctrine they believe that god is the one who puts sickness on you to teach you something to punish you to refine you through the fire and as you're cheerfully enduring that sickness celebrating your cancer or whatever it is that you're somehow glorifying God as he's torturing you. <laughs> and that is absolutely not true. The only one who's glorified in sickness is the devil who put it upon people. Uh, and God is glorified through the healing. And we saw that and we looked at several passages related to that. Okay, then we looked at Lazarus and people are upset because, well, how can you say that God wants everyone healed? Because he delayed coming back to pray for Lazarus, and Lazarus died, you know? I mean, lucky for Lazarus, Jesus raised him from the dead, but he allowed him to die. And the truth is, when you break down the time, you know, first of all, it says that, um, that Lazarus was dead four days in the tomb when Jesus uh, arrived back. But Jesus only delayed his departure two days. So it doesn't matter when Jesus would have left, he couldn't have gotten back in time to lay hands on Lazarus. And, and then also we broke down the time it requ that's required to uh, travel there and travel back. And what we see when we break down the time requirement is that Lazarus, he was actually, he died shortly after the ladies left on the road to go see Jesus. So even before the messengers arrived, Lazarus was already dead. So there's no scenario where Jesus would have had time to get back to Lazarus and pray for him. Uh, or not even pray for him remotely because by the time he got the message, Lazarus was already dead. So the delay was of zero consequence. Okay, so Jesus didn't let him die. Jesus wasn't being mean or anything like that. Uh, that's all false. So today we're going to look at a few of these. Um, we'll look at the passage where it's the Galatians said they would pluck out their eyes for Paul. We'll look at Paul writing supposedly with large letters because he had eye problems. Then, um, time permitting, we'll, we'll get over to Timothy and Epaphroditus. And these, these guys were sick, uh, almost to the point of death. And so all these things become doubts. <clears throat> okay? And then there are some other ones we'll get to. Uh, Trophimus, Paul's thorn, the man born blind. Uh, those we're not going to get to today, though. Okay, so pluck out your eyes for Paul. So number one, many people disbelieve in God's will for all people to be healed because they believe that Paul, the greatest writer of the Bible, was afflicted with a thorn in the flesh, with physical infirmity, and with problems with his eyes. And some people say that Paul's eyes suffered permanent damage on the road to Damascus when he was temporarily blinded. And these beliefs come from a combination of translation problems and non-spirit-filled Bible commentaries and so-called Bible scholars and just shallow reading on the part of, of us. Okay, so let's read these passages. And, and first of all, all these things are not true. Thorn in the flesh was not sickness. 
he didn't have you know sickness of any kind and the problem with his eyes we'll see what that is in just a minute so in galatians 4 13 to 15 you know that because of literally you know that through physical infirmity i preached the gospel to you at the first and my trial was in my flesh and my trial which was in my flesh you did not despise or reject but you received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus what then was the blessing you enjoyed for I bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me okay so obviously something is physically wrong with Paul when he's here with these Galatians right something's wrong with them and in fact, something is wrong with his eyes because that, you know, he's saying that they would have pulled out, they, they would have plucked out their own eyes if possible to give to him. So obviously something had happened to his eyes, but what was it? Okay. What do the Bible scholars say? So if we look at the hero of the Baptist faith, John MacArthur, John MacArthur says this, okay. When it says physical infirmity, he says, some think the illness Paul refers to was malaria, possibly contracted in the coastal lowlands of Pamphylia. Okay, then he says, plucked out your own eyes. This may be a figure of speech or an indication that Paul's bodily illness had somehow affected his eyes. Okay, so, so from John MacArthur's perspective, he thinks that Paul has some illness, possibly malaria, and that whatever illness it is that Paul is suffering from it's also affecting his eyes okay and then we have another person F.B. Meyer and this is another common commentary and he says in Galatians 4:15, we perhaps have a hint as to the nature of Paul's thorn in the flesh this reference has led to many has led many to suppose that he suffered from acute ophthalmalia or inflammation of the eyes okay so this is what just a couple of the Bible scholars think, and I could give you probably a long list of other Bible scholars who will say similar things, okay? All right, all that's wrong, okay? It's wrong. So what's really going on? Okay, let's read number five. First of all, let's just get a context. What was going on in Paul's life? Where was he? Where was he going? What was he doing? Where he was going? Okay, and then we're going to see what happened that wrecked his body so in acts chapter 14 verses 8 to 21 okay and in lystra okay so first of all lystra is here in galatia so we're we're in galatia right so we're in galatia paul's in lystra when this happens and in lystra a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked then jews from antioch and iconium came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Okay, they stoned Paul, dragging him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch okay so get the picture Paul is in Lystra okay and then it says that there were Jews from Antioch and Iconium okay here's Antioch and here's Iconium okay so these the Jews that were in this city and the Jews in this city they came to Lystra where Paul was and then Paul did this horrible deed of healing a lame person and that made them mad and so he got stoned to death, stoned almost to death uh, as a result of the whole incident Okay, because he went on to, to preach against them in the verses that I omitted here. Okay, so they stoned him. And, you know, he was stoned to the point of death. Like, he was nearly dead. They thought he was dead. Maybe he was. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was raised from the dead when the disciples saw him. You know, uh, either way, it doesn't matter. He was at the point of death and from a stoning. Now, what happens when you get stoned? Obviously, you're going to you're going to be smashed with stones. You're going to have bruises, maybe broken bones. Stones are going to hit you in the face. They're going to hit you in the nose, hit you in the mouth, hit you in the eyes, hit you in your body. They're going to hit you everywhere. Like he's stoned almost to the point of death to where they dragged him out of the city and he's as if he's dead. 
So he's obviously in terrible physical condition, correct? Okay, now what did he do? And the next day, okay, the day after getting stoned, he's still bruised, he's still broken, his eyes, his face, his body are messed up from all those stones that pummeled him. The very next day, he went to Derby, and what did he do in Derby? He was preaching the gospel. Amen? So he was preaching the gospel. So this physical infirmity that Paul had was a stoning that he received in Lystra. Okay, so he went from Lystra, stoned to death. He went to, to Derby, and he's beaten terribly with all these stones. His body's in terrible physical condition. He would look terrible to look at from the stoning. He's in Galatia, right? So the physical infirmity that Paul spoke about in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, was from the stoning that he received in Lystra. It wasn't a sickness or a disease. It was a stoning. Paul was nearly stoned to death and was in such bad condition that they dragged him out as though dead. The very next day, he traveled to another Galatian city called Derby to preach the gospel. Paul was obviously battered, bruised, cut, and bleeding. Certainly, stones hit his face as well as his body, and therefore, the Galatians were figuratively willing to give him their healthy eyes to replace his bruised and battered ones. Paul did not suffer from sickness, nor lasting eye problems, but rather he suffered from a stoning due to persecution. It's such a simple explanation, okay? He wasn't sick. God wasn't refusing to heal him. He was persecuted and he was beaten. Amen? So mystery solved. Okay, now let's look at this other mystery, uh, which is where people believe that Paul had, you know, maybe the thorn in the flesh was affecting his eyes, maybe the, maybe, um, you know, this infirmity he spoke about, maybe that's affecting his eyes because he had to write with really big letters. He had to write with large letters because he couldn't see very well. Okay, that's what people say. So where do they get that from? If you read in the New King James Bible, it says this in Galatians 6.11, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Okay, so when you read this, it sounds like he's writing with a big kindergarten pencil, writing like foot, you know, one foot tall alphabets to write a letter because he can't see that well. And that's what many people think. And that's kind of the way it reads, right? So you can't fault anybody for that interpretation. So, number two, many people disbelieve that God wants everyone to be healed because he obviously didn't heal Paul's eyes. People believe that perhaps Paul's thorn in the flesh was a problem with his eyesight. Most popular translations of the Bible talk about what large letters Paul wrote with, presumably because he had trouble seeing. Okay? Number three, this belief about Paul's poor eyesight is further supported by world-renowned, and I say that jokingly, by world-renowned Bible scholars like John MacArthur. Okay, here's what John MacArthur says. With what large letters? This can be interpreted in two ways. Number one, Paul's poor eyesight forced him to use large letters. Okay, and then he goes on with some other stuff. Then we have F.B. Meyer who says, Paul usually dictated his letters, but this was written with his own hand. The characters were large and clear. Perhaps this was due to the trouble with his eyesight referred to in Galatians 4.15. Okay, these are unscholarly scholars, okay? And, and a lot of Bible scholars are the same way, so it's, it's sad but true, okay? And so they have not done their homework to see what's really going on. All you have to do is look up a couple of words and the mystery is solved. And you can even look at some other Bible translations. In fact, when I come across a passage that is confusing or I disagree with, the first thing I do is I go read, you know, five or ten other Bible translations and see if somebody else has rendered it differently. And then if I can find something that, that looks, um, that aligns with what the Spirit inside of me is saying, then I'll embrace that. But then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look up the words myself. And I'm going to look up the words, I'm going to think about the context of the passage, and then I'm going to consider what, what definition did the author intend of the word that they were using in the original language. Okay, and here's such a, an example of that. And in Galatians 6.11, it says, 
Um, if you look at the King James Version, it says, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Okay, now this one reads differently than New King James. Okay, here it says, How large a letter. It, it didn't say, like, large, tall letters on a piece of paper. It says, a large letter. Okay, so let's just get a better understanding here. Is it a letter as in an epistle, or is it letters as in alphabet characters? Okay, so first let's look at the word large. Um, this is pelikos, and this means how great or how large. Okay, so that one's straightforward. Okay, then this word that was brought into English as letter. What is that? This word letter is the Greek word gramma. Gramma is a writing. That is a letter, a note, an epistle, or a book. It has nothing to do with alphabets. It's not alphabets. It's not characters. It's a letter, as in you wrote a letter to your wife. You know, you, you wrote a letter. You wrote an epistle. The book of Galatians is an epistle. The book of Galatians is a grandma. The, the book of Galatians is a letter. Okay, it's not a letter as in alphabets. It's a letter as in a writing. And so this Greek word has nothing at all to do with alphabet characters. It has nothing to do with that. This word grandma is entirely and only about a writing such as an epistle, otherwise known as a letter, a note, something like that. Okay? So absolutely, without a doubt, this has nothing to do with his eyesight. Um, he didn't write with large letters as in alphabets. He wrote large letters like an epistle. He wrote long letters, is how we would say it. Like, he, you know, Hebrew is a long letter. Um, you know, he, he wrote long letters to the people. Corinthians, long letter, right? So the conclusion is that the word letter means writing or epistle. It does not mean letters as in ABC characters. Paul did not write with large letters or alphabets, but rather he wrote long letters or you could say epistles. And we know that to be true. Amen? So, point B is God did not withhold healing Paul's eyes because Paul did not have an enduring problem with his eyesight. The problems he did have with his eyes were twofold. He had temporary blindness from the glorious light he saw on the road to Damascus. And then secondly, he had the stoning in Lystra. And God healed him from both of these things. Okay? So, the moral of this story is we just need to read carefully. I mean, look how simple the answer was, but look how stupid the scholars were. The, the simple thing to do is read a couple translations and, and then look up two words and then the answer is solved. But instead, you have people teaching the entire Baptist church wrong doctrine because they didn't even bother to look up two words to get a correct understanding of the passage. And thus, you have huge denominations that don't believe in healing, don't believe in the power of God, and believe in a lot of wrong things. And it's unfortunate. Okay, now, some people will say, well, why, why did Jesus blind Paul on the road to Damascus? Why did he do that? You know, so they, they may doubt healing because they think that Jesus intentionally blinded Paul. Okay, so let's just read this. So in Acts chapter 9, as Paul journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Okay, so let's just get the picture. So Paul is on the road to Damascus, and then there's this extremely bright light that shines upon him from heaven. Okay, and then when he opened his eyes from that, he was blind. Okay, and he was blind for three days. Okay, now if we fast forward to chapter 22, Paul explains what happened to him. Okay, so Paul is the person who suffered the blindness, and now he's going to tell us why he was blind. And since... I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of those who were with me. I came into Damascus. Okay, so when you look up the word glory, it's, it, it includes the words splendor and brightness. 
splendor and brightness. So this light was just an overpowering bright light. Okay, so his, his eyes were physically overpowered by the brightness of the light, which brought about this blindness condition. He didn't say, Jesus blinded me. He said, the, the glory of the light, the splendor, the brightness of that light, that's what blinded him. So, for example, if you were to, I don't know, if somebody stared at the sun too long, you know, the sun would blind their eyes eventually. Okay, well, Jesus is brighter than that, right? And it would be as if you were closer to the sun. So if, if somebody gets a super bright light shine into their eyes, it can damage the eyes. It's not that it's not that Jesus put a sickness upon him. It's not that Jesus made him blind. It's that it was so bright, glorious, pure, bright, white light. It overpowered his eyes. His body was overpowered and suffered damage. And then Jesus didn't leave him that way. Jesus wanted him healed. And so he sent somebody specifically to heal Paul. Amen? So God is not guilty of blinding Paul by any means. It's just splendor of this bright light caused the problem. And Jesus expediently sent somebody to heal him. So he was in this condition for three days. So quickly he received his healing because Jesus commissioned somebody to lay hands on him. Amen? Okay, now let's look at Timothy. So people, they will doubt healing because, you know, well, what about Timothy? You know, Timothy, he's always having these stomach sicknesses. So it can't be God's will to heal uh, everybody. It can't be God's will for us to walk in health because Timothy was always sick. What about that? Okay, well, let's read the passage. So in 1 Timothy 5.23, no longer, and this is Paul talking to Timothy, okay, giving him some advice. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Okay, so obviously there's something going on with Timothy's stomach. So that's a fact, right? Paul said that Timothy's having some stomach infirmities. So something's going on there. Okay, and because of this, many people doubt God's healing will because Timothy frequently had sicknesses in the stomach. If God's will was that all be healed, then why was Timothy sick in his stomach? Okay, it's a good question. So first of all, just because something is God's will doesn't mean that it will automatically be done. Okay, that's super important. Just because something is God's will does not mean that it will be automatically done. Salvation is not automatic. Okay, no aspect of salvation is automatic. Salvation requires believing in your heart and speaking with your mouth to make it manifest. Okay, such as if you want to be born again, you need to believe that, that God raised Jesus from the dead and you, you need to confess Jesus as Lord. And when you do that, then boom, then you are born again, right? So even though God's will is that all people be saved, it's not automatic. Somebody has to believe first and then speak and then it will happen, okay? Well, if you look at all the other aspects of salvation, like health and healing, these are aspects of salvation. Salvation works the same way in those regards. You have to know what Jesus has done. You have to believe in healing. In other words, that God wants you healed. And then you have to speak your faith. You have to believe in your heart and speak out of your mouth. And then that aspect of salvation, such as healing or health, can be manifest, right? It's the law of faith. So, we must believe in our hearts and speak with our mouths. That's the mechanism of faith. Believe in your heart and speak with your mouth, and then you receive salvation. Okay? Now, even if you do believe in your, in your heart, and even if you do confess with your mouth, um, it could be that the devil may attack someone, in which case, if you want health and if you want healing, you're going to have to resist the devil and make him flee. Okay, so just because you spoke your faith doesn't mean the devil's not going to test you. So the devil may still try and put sickness on Timothy. And so Timothy would have a responsibility to resist the devil and make him flee, assuming that Timothy was cognizant that it was the devil who was doing this to him in the first place. Okay, I don't know if Timothy believed in healing or not. Okay, so we need to believe in our heart, speak with our mouth. And if the devil does come, you still have to resist him. And if you don't resist them, then you can suffer sickness and other issues um, for lack of 
fighting against him. Okay, so I want to prove this first point. Salvation is not automatic. Just because something is God's will doesn't mean it will be done. We come to 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, what is God's will? God's will is he does not want anyone to perish. He wants all people to come to repentance. Well, God's will obviously is not being done because people are dying every day. They're perishing every day. They're disbelieving and perishing every day. They're dying of sickness. They're dying of violence. They're dying a million different ways. People are constantly perishing without repentance. So just because salvation is God's will doesn't mean it's automatic. So just because G, uh, just because healing is God's will doesn't mean it's automatic. Just because Jesus paid for healing doesn't mean it's automatic. Just because Jesus paid for our sins does not mean it's automatic. No aspect of salvation is automatic. And that's uh, that trips people up. You know, just as you had to believe to be born again, you have to believe to be healed. You have to believe to walk in health. You have to believe to effectively resist the devil. So believing is required for each and every aspect of God's will to come to pass. Okay, in Romans 10, 9 to 10, this is the mechanism of faith. This is the mechanism of salvation. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. Amen? Okay, so number six is we must remember that Timothy was traveling all over and therefore was drinking and eating in foreign places. Now, if we think about that in the context of our own lives, what is the first thing that people would say to you if you were to travel to Mexico or India or different places? Um, they would say, don't drink the water. Whatever you do, don't drink the water. Boil the water, get bottled water, but do not drink the water. Okay, so why do they say that? Because when you go to these foreign places, there are bacteria in the water and even in the food that your body is not used to. And these bacteria can cause stomach problems, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, whatever else, such as what Timothy was experiencing, right? He was experiencing frequent infirmities. Timothy was a missionary. Timothy was running around with Paul and they were preaching everywhere, right? So they're constantly traveling and preaching and teaching wherever they go. So he's a missionary. He's going to foreign lands on a frequent basis. So it's quite likely that Paul was giving, you know, missionary advice to Timothy, advice that you would give to a natural person as opposed to a spiritual person. But advice you would give to a natural person is, hey, when you go to Africa, Bobby, don't don't drink you know don't drink the water from the river or from the well or whatever because you don't know what's in there you know or when you go to mexico don't drink the water um because for a natural person who doesn't believe in the promises of god or is not mature in those promises of god then they will experience or they may experience sickness vomiting nausea diarrhea those things okay because that's from the bacteria okay well why did paul tell him to have a little wine well, again, all this is from a natural perspective, not a spiritual perspective. What does alcohol do? Alcohol kills germs, correct? Alcohol kills germs. And so when you mix the alcohol and the water, then presumably the germs would die and it would be safe to drink. And so Paul, in effect, was giving missionary advice to Timothy. Okay, now you shouldn't have to do all that. If Timothy was a fully mature believer, and which he was not, he was Paul's protege, so he was being raised up by Paul, so he was not a fully mature believer, um, but a fully mature believer can drink anything and eat anything that is set before them. Jesus said, eat and drink whatever is set before you when you go out preaching and teaching, right? He said that specifically. Um, and you could also believe in Mark 16, where it says, Believers will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Okay, so 
Plus, there's many other passages. Nothing shall by any means harm you. No evil shall befall you. No plague shall come near your dwelling. You dwell in your body. So if you believe that, then you can eat and drink whatever you want because no plague, whether there's a bacteria in the water water or not, it will not affect you. Whether there's a deadly bacteria or any other bacteria in the water, they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Right? So, truly, Timothy didn't have to suffer these sicknesses. He should not have. Um, truly, he should not have to put wine in the water to drink it. What Timothy really needed was to mature, to believe in the promises about walking in health, drinking any deadly thing. Nothing shall by any means harm you. No plague will come upon you, Timothy. So Timothy needs to be um, raised up in those beliefs, and then you can be a fearless missionary. Amen? Because there are promises of God for everything I just said. There are promises of God for everything I just said so that we don't have to worry about these things. So God's will is that we that we walk in health. Jesus took stripes on his back. He paid for our healing. He bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. Every sickness is a curse. We, Jesus redeemed us from curse. So there's a million angles on God's will is that he wants us well. And there's multiple angles on how Jesus paid for it. Amen. So just because Timothy wasn't walking in full salvation doesn't mean it's not the will of God. Just because Timothy didn't walk in full salvation doesn't mean that you or I should not walk in full salvation. We should. Amen? Okay, and I just want to emphasize one more point. We know that the apostles themselves, they were not fully mature believers at all points in time in the Bible. Okay, so for example, when you read the book of Acts, you'll see people making mistakes. They didn't know the answers to things. They're sending people to go talk to other people to try and get answers about things like circumcision or whatever. And, and then we know even after there was a decision made that they said, okay, well, um, we're redeemed from the law, so we should not do circumcision. Even after that, what does Paul do? He went and had Timothy circumcised. After the fact, after they already had determined that circumcision was of the law and it's a dead work, they still had Timothy circumcised. So these people were not walking in maturity just because just because they wrote a book in the Bible doesn't mean they were fully mature. Because some of those books came forth early in their believing and some came forth later in their believing. And we don't necessarily know when or where, right? And you can see many mistakes that they were making, especially when you read the book of Acts, you get a good history of the ministry and you can see that it, they, they had confusion, they made mistakes, but they were all, they're growing, right? They're moving in the right direction. So it is God's will to be healed. Even if Timothy wasn't walking in health yet, um, it is God's will and it's available for us. And I say, let us just walk in health. Amen. All right, now let's look at Epaphroditus because the Bible says that Epaphroditus was sick almost unto death. Okay, well, how can you believe that God wants everyone healed if Epaphroditus, you know, almost died? Okay, so number one, here's a tradition of men. If God's will truly was that we be healed, yet one of his later disciples was sick almost unto death, then it must not be God's will that all be healed and walk in health. So that people think that just because, you know, a disciple in the Bible was not walking in health, they think that that negates that it's God's will that we all be healed, that we walk in health. They, it becomes a doubt for them that maybe, maybe healing is not for everyone. Okay, so there's different ways people think about it in a negative sense. Okay, let's just read the passage. And we'll see that he wasn't even sick okay it wasn't sickness he was dealing with in philippians chapter 2 verses 25 to 30 yet i considered it necessary to send to you epaphroditus my brother fellow worker and fellow soldier but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, 
and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Okay, so when we read it in English, it says in English that he was sick. It says it two times, right? You heard that Epaphroditus was sick, sick almost unto death. Okay, so sick and sick. Okay, so let's read point three, then we're going to look at a definition. First of all, let's ensure that we read the entire passage and look at the definitions of keywords before drawing conclusions. We see that Epaphroditus was working hard for Christ and he was neglecting his own body and his own life in order to fulfill various needs of people because it said he was working hard to supply what was lacking. What he was actually suffering was not sickness, but rather physical exhaustion from so much work and lack of rest. Okay, let's just look at it again. Most people will read verse 26 and 27, and they'll say, well, it's not God's will for us to be healed because Epaphroditus was sick. It says it twice. Okay, but you have to read the entire context of the passage because verse 30 explains what brought about this situation that he's in. For the work of Christ. Okay, so he's busy doing ministry work. He is like super busy doing, I don't know if he was a missionary or if he's working in, a, in one area, who knows. But he's busy doing work of Christ. And he was working himself to death, like literally. He was working himself to exhaustion. He was not regarding his own life. So he was getting little sleep. He was working hard. He was um, trying to supply what was lacking. Okay, so he was extremely busy. He was just physically exhausted. Okay, so you may say, okay, well, that's a nice idea, Bobby, but prove it. Okay, let's look at the word sick. This word sick is a different word sick than when you talk about diseases, typically. Okay, this word is astheneo in Greek. And this means to be weak, feeble, and without strength, to be powerless. To be weak and means needy, poor, feeble, sick. Okay, so the primary definition here of this word astheneo is weakness, feebleness, without strength. And that is a direct correlation. I mean, it, it's the exact same thing he says in verse 30. It's a direct correlation to that for the work of Christ. So he's busy working hard and he was suffering exhaustion almost to the point of death where he's weak, he's feeble, he's working himself to death. So this has nothing to do this has nothing to do with sickness. It has to do with him neglecting his own health and just pushing through enduring hardship to preach the gospel. That's what's happening. Okay, so let's just um, read these other points here. So number five, um, well, we already talked about all that. Okay, but let's read the last point. So contextually, we can say with absolute certainty that Epaphroditus worked himself nearly to death for the sake of the gospel. He endured hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Okay, and that comes from 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. All right, so Epaphroditus was working for Jesus. He was working hard, doing the ministry work, and he was enduring hardship, neglecting his own needs so that he could serve the people. Okay, so maybe he went too far with it because you know, we wouldn't want Epaphroditus to, to prematurely die from exhaustion, you know, so he was left there to get rest. Amen? All right, let me see how we're doing on time. All right, I think we can do one more. So let's keep going. Okay, so let's read about Paul leaving Trophimus sick in Miletus. So again, many people doubt God's healing will because they see that Paul left someone sick somewhere. And they reason that if the great Apostle Paul couldn't get someone healed, but had to leave them sick, then it must not be God's will for everyone to be healed. 
And if Paul can't get it done, who am I to think that I can get people healed? Okay? So in 2 Timothy 4.20, it says, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. But Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Okay, so again, we have that same word sick, which is a different word sick than what we're normally reading. In fact, let me just show that to you. Give me one second. Okay, let me just show you another word for sick, which we would typically think about when we're talking about sickness. And we're going to go here. Let's blow it up. Okay, and Mark 16, 18. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay, this word sick means um, without strength, sick or weak in the Thayer Dictionary. Um, and in the Strong's Dictionary it says a presumed derivative, infirm, sick. Okay, so infirmity or sickness. If you go to Matthew chapter... eight okay this is where it's talking about what jesus paid for okay so he's quoting okay when when the evening was come they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick okay so here the word sick is the word kakos or kakos, however you say it. Okay, this means badly, physically or morally, amiss, diseased, evil, grievously, miserable, sick, or sore. If you read it in Thayer's Dictionary, miserable, to be ill, wrong, okay, and so forth. Okay, then it goes on to say that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities. Okay, let's look at that word. He took our infirmities. And feebleness, by implication, malady, frailty, disease, infirmity, sickness, weakness. Okay, he took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Okay, this is the word nosos. And nosos means maladies, disabilities, disease, infirmity, sickness. Okay, so when you look at the Bible talking about what Jesus paid for, these words are not just feebleness or what have you. These are very clearly, they bring in words like sickness and disease, malady, right? So the these definitions are definitely more oriented towards sickness and disease than just feebleness. When you look at this word again, astheneo, the primary definition is weakness, feebleness, and being without strength. Okay, so again, our... Our belief here is when we analyze the passage, we see that it is the same word sick that was used with Epaphroditus, which means weak, feeble, and without strength. The truth is that Trophimus also was, from, was exhausted from the work of the gospel that he was doing, and therefore he was left behind to rest. Okay? It's the same, it's the same word. Let's just look. Um, Trophimus was left sick. Astheneo. When we look at Epaphroditus, he was left sick, astheneo. It's weakness, feebleness, it's just physical exhaustion. Amen? Okay, and then I also want to point out that concerning the idea that some people have that Paul didn't heal them all, um, let's consider that he healed them all on the island of Malta when they were shipwrecked. Okay, so Paul did have the ability to heal them all, and he demonstrated it. In Acts chapter 28, and it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this, so when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Okay, so all the sick on the island of Malta were brought to Paul and they were healed. So he healed them all. Amen. He started with Publius. 
Remember, this is the situation where, you know, Paul was under arrest and the ship wrecked, and then he's going to mess with the fire, and a, a snake bit him on the hand, and they thought he was going to drop dead. Instead, he just shook the snake off, and so then they thought maybe he's a god. And so anyway, so they opened up, they warmed up to Paul because of that, what happened with the snake. The snake didn't harm him. And so then he comes, he finds out that Publius was was terribly sick, and so he got healed. And when they saw that, they brought everyone else in the island that was sick, and Paul healed them, he healed them all. Okay, so it's wrong thinking to, to doubt that Paul had the ability to heal. Okay, so physical healing is a little bit different than recovering from exhaustion, right? And you could miraculously be recovered from exhaustion. Um, all things are possible, right? But um, it's a little different scenario. The common cure for exhaustion is rest. And that was what was prescribed to Trophimus in this situation. Okay, but then somebody may still want to argue and they may say, well, how do you know that he, um, somebody may want to contend still. And then what I would say in return, like somebody may argue that um, they maybe they believe it was sickness and not feebleness, not exhaustion. Um, somebody may still fight against us on this. Okay, but remember, just because Paul left him, he left him sick, that doesn't mean he stayed sick. Correct? Because not every healing is boom, instant. So even if Paul left, and when Paul left, Trophimus was sick, with, let's just say a disease, that doesn't mean Trophimus was not healed. Because even with Jesus in his ministry, he did not have 100% instant results. Because as they went, they were healed. When we Let's look at the lepers. So in Luke chapter 17, verses 12 to 14. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Okay, so these people, they are out of the presence of Jesus. Okay, he, he prayed for them. He laid hands on them. And then he sent them on their way. Like he sent them to the priests. So they were off on their way to another town, in fact. And as they went, they were cleansed. So they weren't healed in the presence of Jesus. They were healed sometime later. And it says that later on, one of them, when he realized he was healed, so they were far down the road when they even realized that they were healed. And one of them, when he realized he was healed, he turned around and went back and gave thanks to Jesus. So, so even if Trophimus was sick with the disease, you know, Paul having left him there sick doesn't mean he wasn't healed. It just means it did not happen in Paul's presence. Because healing didn't always happen in Jesus's presence either. Amen? Okay, and then one final point. Lastly, even if a disciple did not get the job done, meaning even if a disciple doesn't get healing to manifest, that still does not negate the fact that Jesus paid for the healing of all people. It only proves that the disciple did not operate in faith in that particular situation. If we pray in faith, we will get results. Consider the epileptic boy that the disciples could not heal, yet Jesus did heal. Okay, so if we look at Matthew chapter 17. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the water and often into the for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation and Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour okay so the disciples in this passage okay before the father brought the boy to Jesus the father had already taken the boy to the disciples of Jesus and the disciples of Jesus were in chapter 17 okay and way earlier in Matthew they were already commissioned and going around healing the sick and they were having great success in healing the sick. Okay, so even after these disciples were experiencing great success in healing the sick, they came across a situation where they failed. And what did Jesus say? 
um, Jesus rebuked them. So he was blaming his disciples for not getting the boy healed. You, you faithless and perverse disciples, right? So he's kind of pointing the finger at them. They were not believing in this particular situation. Okay, and then Jesus showed um, that healing is possible and that it, it is his will, and he went ahead and healed the boy. Okay, so remember, our example as Jesus is not the disciples because the disciples in Matthew, they were not born again. They were not baptized with the Holy Spirit. They did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, whereas we're made like Jesus. We're made exactly the same species as Jesus. We're born again. Hopefully, we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. We've received the power of God. We've received the authority of Christ. So we're greater than the disciples because we are made the same as Jesus was. We're, we're different than how the disciples were. So the, the disciples failed, but Jesus, whom we're the same species as, he was able to get, get the boy healed. Amen? So the will of God is to be healed. Jesus paid for the boy to be healed. But in a situation, the disciples failed. So even in the worst case scenario, what if Paul prayed for Trophimus and he was not healed? That still does not negate healing. That does not negate that Jesus paid for healing. That does not negate that the will of God is that all people be healed. It just means that there could have been failure in one situation. Okay, so the, the key thing is it's incumbent upon us to be believers. We have to be believing. Our primary work is that we must believe. And let me just find a passage to, to reiterate that real quick. So one second. Okay, we're going to go to John chapter 6. starting in verse 28. Then they said to Jesus, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Okay, so they wanted to do the works that Jesus was doing, right? They wanted to do the miraculous works. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Okay, so if we want to work the miraculous works of God, we have to do the primary work. And the primary work is that we need to believe in Jesus whom Father God has sent. And that means we need to have a well-rounded belief in Jesus, knowing that he paid for healing, he paid for protection, he paid for provision, he paid for sins, he paid for all these different things, right? So our work that we need to do is to work at our believing. And as we're believing and praying for things, and boom, it will happen. Boom, like our faith life will be just alive and well and productive. Amen? So, so even if Paul did have a faith failure, that doesn't change the fact that the will of God is that all people be healed. Amen? So I believe the correct interpretation of this passage, it was merely um, exhaustion. But even if you were to argue it in, in different directions, um, we can, we can still say confidently that the will of God is he wants all to be healed and Jesus paid for all, period. Amen.